Hello and welcome back to World 360. ای انسان های آزاده در کنار ما باشید و ما را یاری کنید تا دولت ها دست از حمایت از این رژیم قاتل و کودک کش بردارند Those hard hitting words were those of the Iran supreme leader's niece Her video statement which has now landed her in jail is one of today's three topics. Apart from this, we're also going to be looking at what happens or is happening rather in East Asia, specifically Taiwan, where the president stepped down as the leader of her own party. And lastly, how a new report shows that the UK made a lot of poor choices in the way it distributed its aid to Afghanistan over the last 20 years. Now, these three stories are probably ones you didn't read in your daily news feed. So let's get into them. First, what's happening in Taiwan? On Sunday, after her party fared poorly in local elections, Taiwan's president Tsai Ing-wen stepped down as party leader. She's still president though, and should she run for re-election, would only need to do so in 2024. But her party's poor show in the local elections will have ripples for one opposition, KMT, which is pretty inclined to reunifying with the mainland, which is China, has made electoral strides. The KMT's success in these local polls has also got Beijing excited. Look at what Chinese government mouthpiece Global Times had to say about it. With KMT winning back Taipei and Taiyun, Li Zingweng, predicted that some cities to city exchange mechanisms with Chinese mainland could be restored and operate better, such as the Taipei Shanghai Forum. Now, the Taipei Shanghai Forum is an annual forum between the government and civilians of Shanghai and Taipei that has been going on since 2010. For the last three years, it's been in virtual mode, but in January this year, the budget for this forum was frozen by Taipei City Council in protest against China continuing to send warplanes into Taiwan's airspace. But now, with the Kuomintang, or the KMT, which has long been a strong opposition party in Taiwan, winning local elections in key cities, such events could be revived with more gumption. More so, when the 2024 presidential elections roll around in Taiwan, it'll be worth keeping an eye on KMT. If successful, the KMT could have a completely different foreign policy towards China compared to what we have seen from the current Taiwanese administration run by Tsai Ing-wen. If you aren't familiar with the KMT, it's important to remember that they ruled China before losing a civil war to the communists and fleeing to Taiwan. More importantly, the party says both Taiwan and China belong to one China, a claim largely unpopular with many Taiwanese. In fact, the party's full name translates to the National Party of China. So then, how did a China-friendly party with such a controversial ethos win big in local Taiwanese elections? One theory is that the DPP, which is Tsai Ing-wen's party, focused too much on national issues and raked up the China threat, especially with Nancy Pelosi's visit to Taiwan in the rearview mirror, instead of focusing on domestic issues. The KMT candidates, meanwhile, scarcely mentioned the China threat and rather focused on issues like air pollution in cities like Taichung, COVID-19 vaccine strategies and more. Some experts have also pointed out that the public weren't exactly satisfied with the way that President Tsai Ing-wen's government handled the COVID-19 pandemic. The public has some dissatisfaction with the DPP on this, even though Taiwan has done well, relatively speaking, in pandemic prevention. Huang Wai Hao, a political science professor at National Sun Yat-sen University, told The Guardian. So there could be some public resentment that has also played a role in the recent local elections. But one thing that is clear from these elections is that the KMT has got a significant confidence boost and all eyes are on the 2024 presidential race. Now on to our second topic, which was the teaser clip we played for you at the start of this episode. Faride Morad Khani, that's the name of the outspoken woman in this video who also happens to be the niece of Iran's supreme leader Ayatollah Ali Khamenei. Keep in mind that Iran's supreme leader is the highest ranking political and religious authority of Iran and even the commander-in-chief of the Iranian armed forces which makes his niece's remarks all that more significant. In the three-minute video posted last week, Faride does not mince her words. 
She calls her uncle's government a murderous and child-killing regime. She even appealed to foreign governments to cut all ties with the Iranian government. A recent tweet from her brother confirmed that she was arrested following these remarks. Let's not forget that this has been happening amid major protests in Iran which have been going on for the past three months, sparked by the death of 22-year-old Masa Amini. It has been termed one of the biggest challenges to the country's clerical leadership since the 1979 Islamic Revolution. Now, who is Farideh? Faridei is a well-known human rights activist in Iran and the founder and director of a rights body called Campaign to Support Prisoners. Her late father, Ali Murad Khani Arange, also known as Ali Tehrani, was an opposition figure and a Shiite cleric married to the Supreme Leader's sister. Faridei also an engineer, has been arrested multiple times before. In January this year, she was reportedly arrested by agents from Iran's Ministry of Intelligence and her house was subsequently searched and some of her belongings were seized. Many suspected that this was because of her attending a webinar in October 2021 to celebrate the 83rd birthday of Empress Farah Pahlavi, the widow of the last Shah of Iran. At the webinar, Faridei recited a poem in which she praised the Empress for her contributions to Iranian culture. Now, to jog your memory, the last Shah of Iran was overthrown in the Iranian Revolution in 1979. And the Shah is a reviled figure among the current Iranian leadership, especially for the corruption in his regime. And by extension, so is his wife. Clearly, Faridei comes from a family of dissidents as well. Her father was an opposition figure and a very nuanced dissident. While he opposed the Shah of Iran, he did not support clerics having a role in government in Iran. He fled to Iraq, in fact, in 1984 after facing threats and arrests. Later, Faride's mother, the sister of the Supreme Leader, took her five children and joined her husband in Iraq after a falling out with her family. Now, when Faride's father returned to Iran after his exile in 1995, he was sentenced to 20 years in jail. Faride's father died last month at the age of 96, and unsurprisingly, Iran state media did not issue a statement about his passing. Why isn't this surprising? Because the Supreme Leader Khomeini has, since the 1980s, tried to distance himself from this side of his family. When Faride's mother fled to Iraq in 1985 to reunite with her husband, she and her children arrived in Baghdad with no passports. In fact, at the time, she told the LA Times that she had requested her brother to get passports for the family so they could leave Iran legally, but he didn't help. I telephoned Khomeini's son, Ahmed, and asked him for passports. He also said no, she told the newspaper. Let's move on to the last topic why UK aid to Afghanistan has been quote-unquote unsatisfactory. Before I begin, we need to remember that this report has come from the Independent Commission for Aid Impact or the ICAI, which is an independent body responsible for scrutiny of UK aid. Now, why have a body like this? Because it analyzes whether aid is creating the impact that is intended in a beneficiary country. Also, whatever aid is going to Afghanistan is coming from the UK taxpayer. So such bodies also analyze whether the taxpayers are getting the best value for money when it comes to the distribution and usage of such aid. So what does the ICAI's report say? It says that the £3.5 billion in aid that the UK has given to Afghanistan from 2002 to 2020 failed to achieve its goal of building a viable Afghan state. It also questions the use of aid for funding Afghan police. If we look at the figures, about £252 million was used to fund the salaries of the Afghan National Police, which has been termed by the ICAI as a questionable use of UK aid because the police were primarily assigned to counter-insurgency operations rather than civilian policing. One interesting nugget from the report is this line. The report found that attempts were made to end police funding, but they were overruled at the highest levels of the UK government. Unfortunately, the report doesn't tell us when such suggestions were struck down, which would have helped us pinpoint which UK government was in power at the time. But if we look at the time period from 2002 to 2020, there were about five UK PMs, Tony Blair, Gordon Brown, David Cameron, Theresa May and Boris Johnson. So perhaps it was one of these governments that overruled such suggestions. Why they did so is also another compelling question. In short, the ICAI rated the UK's development assistance to Afghanistan as the second worst category 
amber red, meaning unsatisfactory achievement in most areas. With the Taliban back in power, there are also concerns as to whether the gains made by the UK's aid program in Afghanistan, whether it was improving literacy and reducing child mortality, for example, will last under Taliban rule. Well, there you have it, three geopolitical issues that you probably didn't come across in your daily news feed. I hope you enjoyed. Thank you so much for watching and do keep writing in with your suggestions. This is Pia Krishnkuti for The Print.